Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about the period from roughly 1820 to 1840, thinking about the idea of democracy and American culture. This is sometimes also called the Jacksonian era or the age of Jackson after President Andrew Jackson, who is really the towering and overshadowing figure of this era. This period sees an extension of democracy and voting rights in the country far beyond what we had seen before. However, it also leaves a very mixed legacy in terms of the extension of rights to African Americans, to women, and to Native Americans along with other minorities. In the early decades of the 19th century, voting rights in America were transformed. Many states at the beginning of that period had property restrictions on voting rights or other kinds of restrictions. As the decades went on, many of those property restrictions were removed, meaning that the poor and those without a whole lot of property or any property were able to vote. Now, of course, in that era, this applies only to white men. The views of foreign travelers who came to the United States give us a sense of what that meant in their eyes. Most famous among them was a young French nobleman named Count Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote Democracy in America in 1835 about his travels across the country. In that account, Tocqueville wrote, No novelty in the United States struck me more vividly during my stay there than the equality of conditions. It was easy to see the immense influence of this basic fact on the whole course of society. Other visitors made similar observations. Michael Chevalier, another French visitor, noted the term Democrat, which elsewhere would fill even Republicans with terror, is here greeted with acclamations. Others commented on a habit such as shaking hands, which indicated equality between two people meeting each other rather than the customary and more formal practices of bowing or uh, kneeling before one's superior. And finally, another visitor commented, there is but one conveyance, it may be said, for every class of people. The coach, the railroad, or steamboat, as well as most of the hotels, being open to all. The consequence is that the society is very much mixed. So just note that for each of these foreign visitors, this was an unusual and surprising element of American society, this emphasis on equality uh, amongst everyone. And by the way, as a, a quick note, we will be talking about uh, the revolution that occurs in various forms of transportation as well. So don't be alarmed uh, hearing about railroads and steamboats, which we have not discussed yet. We will get there shortly. There was much debate in those early decades of the 19th century about voting rights and whether they should be tied to property ownership or some kind of elite class. There were still many of the Hamiltonian tradition who argued that governance is best left in the hands of those with means and with education, rather than having it be extended to all. There was a growing trend, though, in support of extension of voting rights with no property restrictions. Nathan Sanford, a lawyer from Long Island, expressed the argument for that practice well when he said, To me, it appeared the only reasonable scheme that those who are to be affected by the acts of the government should be annually entitled to vote for those who administer it. So this is a similar argument that was made during the age of the revolution. Remember the idea of taxation without representation. Well, here again is representation. If you are being affected by those who are in power, then you should have the right to vote for those in power, whether you own property or not. It's a powerful and compelling argument. And as it turns out, that is the argument that held the day in this era. <laughs> 
We also in this period see the practice of serving in government being extended to more and more types of Americans. We talked in an earlier lecture about the middling sort and the kind of rise in politics of those who might not have been from the elite. And that practice is continuing in the era of the early 1800s. One famous example is Davy Crockett, who is uh, certainly a heroic figure in American folklore for lots of the the mythical kind of exploits uh, of um, killing animals and wrestling bears and things of that nature. Um, but Davy Crockett was also a politician in his era. Uh, he was born in Tennessee, fought with Andrew Jackson during some of the Indian Wars and was uh, certainly a, a decorated soldier, and then eventually returned home to Tennessee and served in the legislature there. So as one uh, magazine commented, democracy and the far west made Crockett. He is a, Prockett, a product of forests, freedom, universal suffrage, and bear hunts. Davy Crockett is this sort of mythical folkloric figure. Far more important for his broad impact on the country is the other person pictured here, Andrew Jackson, who is the titular figure of this chapter and one of the most important in the country in the era that we are discussing. Um, Jackson, though, is reflective of the same kind of idea that politics in the country were now pulling us to Western figures, to those who uh, had fought in the military, particularly against Native Americans. Um, this kind of bold frontier kind of mindset is becoming more attractive in American politics. So we've already been introduced to Andrew Jackson a couple of times uh, previously in this course. He was also from Tennessee, and as you might recall, he had made his reputation uh, as an Indian fighter and also uh, in winning the Battle of New Orleans at the end of the War of 1812. Uh, one of his supporters had this to say about uh, Jackson's rise to prominence. In Europe... Custom decree that kings shall rule and the people submit. In this wilderness, as if by magic, a new and different order of things has appeared. Jackson became a fitting symbol for this age. He was an orphan who grew to become a rich planter, a self-made man, rising to the White House and the presidency itself. For many, he epitomized all of the possibilities that this nation held. But for others, his appeal to the common man and broad democracy signaled the reign of the mob and struck fear in the hearts of many. The election of 1824 pitted many of the luminaries of this age against each other, including John Quincy Adams, whom we have already been introduced to in previous lectures. He was Secretary of State under James Monroe. John C. Calhoun from South Carolina, who we will be speaking about much more uh, in future lectures. And Henry Clay of Kentucky, whom we have already talked about in previous lectures as well, as the great compromiser, the architect of the Missouri Compromise. Uh, and another candidate is Andrew Jackson himself. So we're going to be talking about each of these candidates uh, briefly and then getting to the outcome of the election. John Quincy Adams may have been the favorite heading into this election cycle. As mentioned, he was Secretary of State and had um, notched a number of important accomplishments in that role. Uh, he had overseen the, the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the War of 1812 also um, formulated the Monroe Doctrine, and he was the son of former President John Adams. So there is something perhaps in uh, the bloodlines that gave him an advantage. John C. Calhoun of South Carolina had been a prominent war hawk um, during the War of 1812, but uh, withdrew from this race fairly quickly, recognizing that with such a crowded field, he was unlikely to win the presidency, and he thought that would position him better uh, 
um, to perhaps be designated uh, a vice presidential candidate. Henry Clay was another prominent candidate. The Speaker of the House from Kentucky advocated a plan he called the American System, uh, an aggressive plan of uh, federal advance, including many internal improvements like building roads and bridges, support for the National Bank, uh, also support for American industry and producers, and the implementation of tariffs to protect American industry. Andrew Jackson joined this crowded field less with a fixed set of policies and more with his personality and character. He portrayed himself as kind of a frontier hero, uh, a military hero who was simply the right person to lead the country rather than running on a set of fixed policies at that point. And as it turned out, Andrew Jackson met with considerable success. He won 44% of the popular vote and had the most electoral votes uh, after the first run of voting. But according to the rules of that day, because he didn't have a majority in the Electoral College, the election went to the House of Representatives to be decided. And the deliberations there favored Henry Clay because Henry Clay was, after all, Speaker of the House, um, and he was very prominent in that body. Now, Clay understood that he hadn't gotten enough electoral votes to really be considered for the presidency, but he threw his support behind John Quincy Adams, and Adams was ultimately chosen by the House, and he would win the presidency in this election. Shortly after, Adams chose Clay to be his Secretary of State, which was, uh, of course, a great boon to Clay's career. This, in the view of some, and most notably in the view of Andrew Jackson, was known as the corrupt bargain. Essentially, Clay trading his support for John Quincy Adams and the presidency to be named Secretary of State in the aftermath. In addition to appointing Clay as Secretary of State, Adams also supported his American system and threw his support behind a number of those programs, including building new roads and canals and so on. While the corrupt bargain put something of a stain on the beginning of Adams' presidency, and Andrew Jackson would certainly come back to it in the election of 1828, Adams was hardly corrupt. He was actually a strong believer in uh, virtue in public office, and rather than appointing his friends and even political allies to various offices, he chose men that he thought would be the best at it, regardless of party. And while this may have been an admirable goal, it led to much dissension within the ranks of his cabinet and other officials, and so it became hard for Adams to get things done because he generally didn't have much of a consensus behind him, even within his own offices. Whatever his virtues may have been, Adams smacked to too many Americans of the old Federalist, almost American royalty, and ruled by an educated elite few. As we will discuss in the, the winds of the day of the early 1820s, too much of the country was moving in the direction of popular democracy, and Adams was simply not suited for that role. So he was destined to be merely a one-term president, although he does run for re-election in 1828, where he runs up against his old rival, Andrew Jackson. <laughs>